To those of you living in the UK, good evening. To those in Australia, good morning. And to those working for the European Union, goodbye. I'm speaking to you as a member of the Campaign for an Independent Britain, first formed in 1969. We are cross-party, non-racist and non-sectarian, supported by public donations. What do we stand for? Well, I suppose the opposite of what most British politicians stand for. We want the United Kingdom to withdraw from the European Union. We seek the repeal of the European Communities Act 1972, under which EU law takes precedence over UK laws. Once self-government has been recovered, our country would be free as an independent nation state to cooperate and trade with our neighbours in Europe and with countries elsewhere in the world without the restrictions imposed by EU membership. This does not make us anti-European, which is just a silly jibe from our opponents. On the contrary, we support friendly nations with our European neighbours. How did we get into this mess in the first place, you might ask? In the early 1970s, Ted Heath, our one-time Conservative Prime Minister, wanted us all to join a common market. He said he would do this only with the wholehearted consent of the British public. I suppose he was so busy, he forgot to ask us. And although the Labour Party fought tooth and nail to keep us out, in we went. He also made a promise that there would be no essential loss of sovereignty. Sovereignty is like a car, take the steering wheel out and you lose all control of where you are going. Now, we would like to think that all our politicians look after us, respect our British constitution and honour their oath of allegiance to the Crown. That is why we pay them so much and pay for second homes in London, long holidays and very nice pensions. Some MPs do an excellent job, others prefer to do what they are told to do as not to harm their careers, like voting to pass the EU Constitution Lisbon Treaty, even if they hadn't read it. But what did go on inside our Parliament in 1971 and 1972? And what has happened to our Parliament ever since? Quoting from the recorded facts and from the personal experiences of men who were in Parliament at that time, we want to tell you how we were all led up the garden path. Listen to what ex-MPs have to say about how they and the rest of us were never told the whole truth, as most of the Labour Party sought unsuccessfully to keep us out of the common market. It was a battle won by the Conservative and Liberal parties by a very narrow margin. The Labour Party in the general election of 1983 promised to take us out of the European community if elected, so that, for example, we could all buy cheaper food. The Labour Party lost that election, but two men won their Labour seats in Parliament for the very first time, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, who promptly forgot their manifesto promise. Tony Blair had promised in his election address at Sedgefield, we'll negotiate a withdrawal from the EEC, which has drained our natural resources and destroyed jobs. One day, with the help of MPs loyal to the Crown and not to the EU, the 1972 European Communities Act will be repealed to enable us to govern our own country once again with a parliament that is more than a bus stop to and from Brussels if we have politicians we can trust. There is a better future for us all in the wide world outside restrictive EU membership. Conservative, Labour and Lib Dem parties try to hoodwink us by saying that our country cannot cope on our own in this modern world. Don't try telling that to your grandfather and grandmother. My name is Teddy Taylor and the one thing which I think everyone will have noticed is that since we joined the European Union our weather has got worse. <laughs> now why is that? You get all the politicians will say it's nothing to do with us and of course they're all to blame. But the sad fact is our weather is getting worse and worse and nobody seems to care about it. 
That's why we're setting up a new party in Britain, which is called the Sunshine Party. And that'll guarantee sunshine, come what may. I'm one of a group of people, sometimes big, sometimes small, in the Conservative Party, who oppose membership of the common market. I was actually a member of Mr Heath's government. I was a junior minister in Scotland responsible for education. But unfortunately, I had to resign my post because I was so opposed to membership of the EU. Now, my views are probably those of the majority of people in Britain now. If you were to go out and ask people in the street, what do you think of the European Union? They think it's a mess. They think there's a lot of our money's being wasted. They think laws are being applied unnecessarily, that our legal affairs are being unfortunately knocked in the head. But why did it all happen, they say? Now, quite frankly, I was there. I took part in opposing membership. I also opposed all the treaties we've had since then, got into me terrible troubles with the party. But what I would like to say is, at that time, round about 1972-73, the great majority of people in Britain actually were for the European Union. They thought it was a great idea. They thought, first of all, it would bring us more prosperity because they said Europe's very prosperous, we're not doing quite so well. And the other thing was that all the fears they had, they were told didn't matter. I mean, one thing they were told, for example, was that while Europe has done quite a few things, they can't do anything more unless we agree because we've got something called the veto. Now, we don't have that now, unfortunately. The veto has basically disappeared. The other thing we were told was it would help our trade, because our trade with Europe wasn't very good, and they said this would make it better. And the other thing they said was that while they do spend money, if they want to spend more, we've got to agree. Now, unfortunately, everything's gone wrong since then, and all the assurances we've had have simply disappeared. But in fairness, when I look back to that time, 1972 or so, at the time, the discussions were actually very nice. There was no great disagreement, and everyone was very polite about it. I remember trying to get people agitated about the decision, but you found the majority of politicians were very pleasant and very agreeable. The Labour Party, the Tory Party, and the Liberal Democrats had all, and at occasions, been basically for. And the problem you had for the average voter in Britain was, which party could they vote for? because none of them seemed to be helpful at all. But what actually did happen? I remember when I resigned my post in the Conservative government, Mr Heath couldn't have been nicer. He invited me along for a cup of tea and he explained that the great majority of wise people were for Europe as only really silly old dodgers who were against it, and that I had a great future in politics and I'd throw it away if I resigned from the government. He couldn't have been better. But of course I felt it was something that was wrong. Because what worried me most, and I think it's still worrying people today, is that basically our democracy is undermined by Europe. The kind of things that people used to decide, we can no longer decide. Our parliament, which used to decide the big issues, now decides, according to the Germans, they say that round about 83% of all the legislation is now decided in Europe. So our parliament's becoming useless. We've got more politicians than ever before. For example, we've got a European Parliament, which is the biggest joke that ever was. If it closed its door tomorrow, nobody would really notice apart from the taxi drivers of Strasbourg. You're going to be voting the European elections later this year. What can you vote about? I mean, the plain fact is you're not voting for a person because you vote for a party, for in our case, for the East of England, and the parties then decide who goes and who doesn't. And the other problem you have is that basically the MEPs don't decide things. Things are decided, unfortunately, in Europe by majority vote at the Council of Ministers, by the European Union, and by the court. And so basically, what on earth can you vote about in European elections? Now, this is what's happened. One of the consequences of joining the European Union is that people have switched off from politics. They don't think any of the parties are terribly interesting or terribly good. And young people in particular have switched off from party politics. This is not good for any of us, and it's not good, certainly, for Britain. The other thing I would ask people is a few simple questions. Number one, which are the most prosperous countries in Europe? I was over in the other countries when they were having referendums of whether they should join. If you look at it today, the two countries in Europe with the highest rates of living and the lowest rates of unemployment are actually Switzerland and Norway. 
Now, these were the two countries which were told, you'll be ruined if you don't join the European Union. Now, happily, they didn't join, and it's been quite good for us. The second thing is, what rights do people have to decide things in Europe? Do you know that Europe is the only country, or the only organisation in the world that I know of, which has not had its accounts approved by the auditors for 13 years? Do you know of any other organisation in that situation? If it was a private company, they'd lock them all up in prison. But the plain fact is the auditors who are employed by Europe won't sign their figures because they say money's being wasted, money's being misused, and things are going terribly wrong. Now, quite honestly, that's terribly wrong. Now, what can you do about it? And this is the real disaster of Europe. And I told this to all the prime ministers, including Mr Heath and Mrs Thatcher. The tragedy is people can no longer decide these things. And this is the biggest problem. The third thing that worries me a great deal is what we're doing to the third world. People should be worried about the third world because people are living in misery there and everything's going wrong. What we do through our agricultural policy is really foul, filthy and wrong when you think of the effect this has on the third world. Say we take a simple thing like sugar. We pay our farmers in Essex an awful lot of money for producing sugar beet. And then we give them an awful lot of money for dumping this in the third world. Now how does this help the third world? It simply means their living standards go down and their future is undermined. I would like to see us having a democracy brought back to Britain. I would like to see us having that right. Now, how can we do this? And this is the trouble. The first thing I think everyone in Britain should start trying to work out is what's happened to us since we joined the European Union? What's happened to the money we pay in? I think you should ask your MP and your MEP, if you have one, of course you don't have one, you just have one for an area, how much does it cost us every minute or every hour to be in the European Union? How much money do we send them and what do they do with it? Now it's a simple question. How much is it now? How much was it in 1973? Secondly, what about the price of food? The price of food in Britain, of course, has gone up because of the EU. But how much has it gone up? And how can we compare it with what it was in 1973? The third thing is what's happened to our trade. I get MPs who ask questions regularly about this. What's happened to our trade? We were told it was going to improve, but here are the official figures which show that instead of improving, it simply got worse. The only thing you can be sure about Europe is it hasn't helped us in any way. Now, of course, people have to behave themselves in politics, and although Mr Heath was a perfect gentleman, after they made the decision to join, people got very nasty. I remember having the first, Mrs Thatcher said the first time she'd ever known me to be shouting at a lady was when she was signing the Single European Act, which brought in majority voting and meant that basically things were decided in Europe by majority vote. Now, Mrs Thatcher worked terribly hard for Britain trying to get the expenditure reduced, but this mattered a great deal and we had a row about that. I don't know, with poor Mr Major, there was a group of eight of us, and here's this group of eight, you'll see them here. They were the group of eight who were thrown out of the party. Now, normally, when someone's thrown out of the party, that means they lose their seat in Parliament. In actual fact, it didn't happen, because our constituents stood by us, and the party had to crawl on their hands and knees and invite us back. But what can you do? If you, like me, thinks that it's a very bad idea, what we can do is we can put down motions. I've just brought along with me a very nice motion people, some MPs signed when I was thrown out of the Conservative government for not supporting joining the European Union. They couldn't have been nicer. They were very agreeable. The MPs can talk about things. I've got here Hansard. It's a wonderful thing. This was back in 1971 when we were having a big debate. And of course, this is when they were deciding was the good thing or a bad thing and by a small majority they decided it was probably a good thing. But the main thing I'd like to ask you all is, what can you do about it? There's one message of hope. The Lisbon Treaty, which has got so many nasty things in it, has got one nice thing in it, and that is a provision for the first time since the European Union was established, which says that member states, if they negotiate to withdraw for two years and don't succeed, they can simply leave the European Union. Well, that's something new and rather exciting. 
And if by any chance the Lisbon Treaty does come into force and will bring lots of problems with it, let's not forget this and let's try and make sure that we will have the opportunity of considering whether we can do it. So does it really matter? I think it matters when you find the number of people voting going down and down, that we get more politicians than we've ever had in the history of Britain with the British Parliament, the European Parliament, and we've got our Scottish and Welsh assemblies too, and the Irish one. Why should we go ahead undermining our democracy when our democracy matters more than anything else? I'd say that what democracy does is it preserves the right of people to decide things. Now the people don't have the right at all. If you think it's wrong what's happening with the European Union, if you think the way they spend money is shameful and shocking, what can you do? And the answer is nothing at all. So we want to try and get that power back. And the second thing we want to do is to get the parties to agree to tell us all the truth about Europe. How much money are we paying in every week? What's happened to our trade with Europe since we've joined? And what are we doing to the third world? We've got to do something. That's what CIB are doing in a splendid way. They're trying to get people interested in Europe, trying to get people to remember that when democracy is abolished, it's bad for everyone, not just in Britain, but in the other countries too. So let's try and stir things up. Let's try very hard to tell people the truth about Europe, to get them to realize that democracy matters and also to remind all the political parties there's no point in having them at all unless they've got the power to do something. So let's start a fight for democracy. That's what matters and that's what I hope you'll all do.